How many people here find it easier to forget something than, they, uh, than to remember it? I think a lot of us find it much easier, don't we, to forget than to remember, especially when the things that we're trying to remember are things that are not part of our day-to-day -day routine. How many of us have ever forgotten birthdays, anniversaries, or even Mother's Day? I'm sure right now there's a lot of people in this country who have forgotten Mother's Day who are rushing around this morning. At other times, we're very good at remembering an event, but we forget its significance. Um, so we're coming up to Easter and our society seems to have forgotten what Easter is all about. For them now, it's um, maybe something to do with new life. But for most people, it's just a celebration of eating too much chocolate. And the real reason for Easter has been forgotten. And this go just goes to show you that unless you carefully remember something, it is very easy to forget. Of course, this is nothing new. People have been this way since the fall of man, and God knows all about our weaknesses and about our failings, which is why he helps us to remember the really important things. One of the ways that he does this, um, especially in the Old Testament, is that he gives the people of God festivals and feasts, which point back to what he has done for them in the past. And those feasts serve as a reminder of the great things that God has done. So in the Old Testament, we see the nation of Israel holding several feasts right through the year. As Christians, of course, our great time of remembrance is gathering around the Lord's table, sharing communion with one another. And as we do that, we look back to those dreadful hours that our Lord and Saviour hung on the cross in our place as a substitute. He carried all of God's righteous wrath that was directed against the sin that we had committed and in exchange, we are clothed in his righteousness, that we are forgiven, we are justified, and we are adopted. Of course, for those who are living before the time of Christ, who are among the people of God, they look back in time to a different act of redemption, a moment which provided a, a pale reflection, a mirror image of the greater act of salvation that our Lord and Saviour would achieve on the cross. And that moment was, of course, the Passover. This Passover feast was held once a year to remind the people how the Lord had protected his people during that dreadful night in the land of Egypt. And then that Passover night was followed by a second celebration, a week long celebration, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, where the people remembered how the Lord God Almighty had brought them out of slavery in Egypt. So let's have a look now at how the nation of Israel was to celebrate and carefully remember these events. Now in Exodus 11, you've already looked at what the Lord was going to do during the Passover, how he would pass through the land and kill all of the firstborn of both the Egyptians and their cattle. Now in Exodus chapter 12, we read about what the Israelites must do and how these actions are to be kept as a lasting memorial to what the Lord has done for them. So as we go through these notes, these verses, it's important to uh, just notice that the first 20 verses, here we have the Lord speaking directly to Moses and Aaron. And in many ways, this section of Exodus would be more at home in the book of Leviticus because it reads like a section of the law. Here we see the Lord laying down how the people should obey him before they even got out of Egypt, before they got to Mount Sinai and received the Ten Commandments. While they're still in Egypt, the Lord is telling them what they should be doing. And Moses and Aaron, they listen to what the Lord says. And then in verses 21 to 28, they're passing on the Lord's words to the people. So that's why there seems to be a little bit of repetition here in this passage. But Moses and Aaron are doing exactly what they should be doing. They are both uh, Levites, of course, Aaron will become in time the high priest, and their role is to, you know, in a sense, take the Lord's words and teach the people, and that's what they're doing here. And then we see how the people respond. They respond with both worship and obedience. So as we look at what the Lord is saying, we see that the first word of instruction is a change to their calendar. For the people of Israel, the Passover is a new beginning. It will become an annual celebration, which they will set their calendar by. However, they used to measure time 
will now change. And for them, the Passover will be held in the first month of the year. Being the people of God brings all sorts of changes. And one of the changes it brings is how we view the passing of time. For these people, being the people of God is going to really change how they identify, um, how they behave and how they uh, view at time. Uh, for us as Christians, we see a similar sort of uh, uh, change when we become a new creation. We have a completely different way of viewing the world around us. Many of us may look back to the dates that we were saved. The Christian recognizes the blessings that are given to them by God, how the Lord has given us life and salvation and family and friends and so on. We have so much that we are to be grateful for. So it's right that we always start off with giving thanks to the Lord. It's why so many Christians have a quiet time at the beginning of the day, because it's good to start the day with thanks. And as believers, we should be folk who love to remember everything that the Lord has done for us. So the Passover was going to be a start of the year, a big celebration of what the Lord has done. We then move on to the heart of the Passover feast, which is this um, lamb, a lamb that is carefully selected. It had to be a year old male and it had to be perfect. And to make sure that it was perfect, the lamb had to be kept for four days after being selected and before being slaughtered, just to make sure that it was fit for the task in hand. Perfect animals were always used for sacrifice because it is right to give our very best to the Lord. And all of the lambs were to be slaughtered at the same time. So there was a real sense of unity among the people. They were all in it together. They were all worshiping the Lord together. They were all saved in the same way. It was reminding them that they were all the people of God. Now, as any of you who are farmers or keep livestock will know, um, a year old male lamb um, is nearly full grown. And we see that part of the Passover regulations is that this animal must be completely consumed in that night. So the people are instructed to gather as families or in groups large enough to eat all of the meat um, during the meal. And this leads to um, a question, doesn't it? Um, why did all of the meat have to be consumed? If we think back to the very first Passover, if we think what's going to happen next, and the Israelites know what's happening next because God has told them that this is the plague that's going to work and they're going to leave. If we put ourselves in their shoes, we might be tempted by the thought of some lamb sandwiches on the way out of Egypt. You know, something to give us strength for the long journey ahead. Why not save some of it? Why does the Lord command that it should all be eaten? Well, in answering this, we need to remember that the Passover is more than just a meal. It has a deep spiritual meaning. A perfect animal has been selected. And the way that this animal is perfect, it sort of reflects the, what was required for an animal that was going to be used for the burnt offering for sin. If you look in Leviticus chapter one, we see that the animal selected for a sin offering, an offering of atonement, also had to be perfect and it had to be totally consumed. So the Passover lamb, is more of a, a sacrifice uh, than a meal. And the lamb is acting as a substitute for the firstborn. It is giving its life. Its blood is being painted on the door so that the Lord will pass over that household and all inside will live. Therefore, on that first night, it is far more than a meal. The lamb is this substitute and the meal itself must be eaten in haste. So the people have got to be ready to go. And that's so different to the feast days that we celebrate. For us, the biggest feast day would, of course, be Christmas Day, where we sit down and we have an enormous meal. And then afterwards, we have a comfortable afternoon sitting there with our slippers on, relaxing and spending time with the family and uh, maybe playing you know, board games or watching TV or something like that. It's a restful time, but not the Passover. The Passover was to be eaten at speed with the people ready to go. In many ways, it was the equivalent of fast food, food that was quickly prepared, meat that was roasted. That's the quickest way of cooking, a, cooking an animal. And then there were bitter herbs, 
herbs that were very easy to select. They were and pick. They were all around. And then unleavened bread, once again, quick to prepare. And the people had to be ready to go. So the modern day equivalent would be that you sit in there eating this feet with your walking boots and backpacks on and your waterproof zipped up, ready to leave the house at a moment's notice because the Lord was about to bring the final plague and the people had to be ready to move. Now, this plague was going to be unlike anything that had gone before it. The other plagues had been mediated in one way or another by Moses and Aaron. So God had told them what to say and then they had to do something and that brought the plague down on the land. But this time God was going to act directly. He will pass through Egypt, striking down the firstborn in this tenth and final plague. This plague that will bring judgment on the gods of Egypt and demonstrate that the God of the Hebrews is the true and living God. Now, some people may question why so many plagues had to be inflicted upon these people before they got the message. And there is a reasonable explanation to this. We have to remember how the Egyptians thought and saw the world. Now, in those days, Egypt was the strongest nation on earth. And in their thinking, this success was linked to them worshipping what they thought were the strongest gods. And they had many gods. They were polytheists. They had gods for all sorts of things. And if a god was shown to be weak in one area, that didn't matter because they had so many other gods. So as we go through these nine previous plagues, we see one Egyptian deity after another being knocked off its perch in the people's thinking. God is humiliating each one, each figure in the Egyptian pantheon. And this final plague would show just how foolish this religious setup really was. At the end of the day, these people were worshipping these uh, false gods for the gift of life and fertility. The final plague would rob them of both as their firstborn all died. And all of the surrounding nations would see how pitiful the Egyptian gods really were, while the Jews who had been 430 years in the land of Egypt, who would have forgotten many things that the patriarchs would have known about God, would get to see that their God was the Lord God Almighty, the one who is all powerful, the one who has the key to life. And as this plague arrives, this is exactly what happens. God does what he promises. He passes over the houses which have got blood painted on their door frames, while all those that are not covered in this way see the loss of their firstborn. Now, obviously, this raises a lot of questions, some from Christians, because we want to understand what's going on there. And at least one question from unbelievers, which might be difficult for us to answer. So at this point, the believer may might ask, why did the doorposts have to be painted? God knows everything. He knows where his people are. In the earlier plagues from the fourth onwards, he has made a distinction between his plague and the Egyptians. What's going on here? Well, the answer to that one is twofold. First of all, performing the Passover as prescribed is an act of obedience on the part of the Jews. At this moment, you had to be more than just a child of Abraham. You had to be an obedient child of Abraham. And the Lord always expects his people to be obedient to all of his commands. So it was a measure, really, a test of their faith. He was giving them these things to do. And, uh, you know, he could see what their faith was like. Secondly, we have to remember the sacrificial nature of the lamb. It is acting as a substitute. The lamb is dying instead of the firstborn. It's not that the Lord is just walking by them. He passes over because of the blood of the substitutes. This most important Jewish festival has got substitution at its heart. And the people are commanded to teach this to their children as something to remember. They're not to wait for the children to ask, but they're commanded to teach the next generation and the next generation and the next generation about what the Passover means. And there at the heart of it is this idea that a perfect innocent could give its life in exchange for another. And this leads on to another important question. Why did all of the people have to take part in the meal? Why not just the firstborn? And the answer to this is because of the relationship that the Lord shared with his people. 
Earlier in the book of Exodus, in chapter 4, verse 22, we read of the Lord saying, Israel is my firstborn son. All of the people were classed as the Lord's firstborn son in uh, this case, which means every member of the community had to take part in eating the Passover lamb. Now, the answer to these questions help us to dig deeper into the significance of the Passover. And I'm sure you can see some clear links between the Passover and uh, the cross and communion. But before we go on to talk about those things, there is another question, the sort of question our non-Christian friends might ask, which also needs to be addressed. And that question is, how can a God of love kill children? That's the sort of question that someone might ask when they read this for the first time. Now, it's a hard question and it's uh, and answering it is complicated by the fact that for a lot of people, if they believe in God, they believe in a God of their own making. They believe in a God who is a God of love. And their idea of this God of love is maybe a little bit like a very kind grandfather who will still give you sweets, even when you have been naughty. And if that's someone's idea of what God is like, then they cannot get their heads around what is happening here in this passage. But when we look at scripture, when we allow God to define himself as he's revealed in his word, we get to meet the true and living God. And we find that God is a God of love but he's also a God who is good. He is righteous. He is holy. He is just. And there's this whole long list of attributes and all of them are linked together and they're interrelated. So we can never say that God is just one thing and nothing else. And even if we say that God is a God of love and focus on that, we have to ask, how can a loving God ignore the crimes of the Egyptians? Remember how the book of Exodus started? with the Israelite babies being drowned in the river Nile. Love cannot stand aside and do nothing when it sees great evil. As well as being a God of love, God is also, of course, a just God who uses what is known as retributive justice. That is, the evil that you intend for another is turned back on you. The punishment will always fit the crime. And when we put these thoughts together, then we realize that God's actions are both proportionate and, if anything, restrained. Go back to those terrible opening verses of Exodus, where we read about these Israelite babies who are suffering a horrible death by drowning, with the families uh, being unable to even recover their bodies. In contrast, look at what the Lord is doing. He is passing through the land and he is just taking the life, the life that he has given from these firstborn. And he allows the Egyptians to mourn for their lost ones. This is the God that one day each and every person will meet. Our situation is a lot like what's going on here in, um, um, in Egypt. Because uh, at the moment, God is uh, sending his messengers. He's sending Christians. He's sending pastors. He's sending his evangelists. And we're proclaiming the gospel to people. The good news that all who turn to Jesus Christ and put their faith in him will be forgiven. And that message is going out there. And it's going out there. But sadly, it's falling on deaf ears. And eventually, those that ignore God, well, one day, they're going to meet God. Either they're going to die or our Lord and Savior is going to return and they're going to come face to face with God and God will deal directly with them. And on that day, only those who have put their trust in Jesus as their Lord and Savior will be OK. For them, there is nothing to fear because the son has died as their substitute. Now, today, I don't know who's listening to this. I don't know who's going to watch the recording, but there may be someone who has not yet made that step of faith. There may be someone who has not put their trust in Jesus as their Lord and Savior. There may be someone who is still in a very dangerous place. They're on that road to disaster. One day you will meet God and you will be called to account for all of your bad days, bad deeds, even the things that you have forgotten about. If that's you, then you are in a bad place right now. But there is hope. 
Jesus died and rose again to take the punishment for all those people who believe in him. If you recognize that you have done things wrong and trust that Jesus can forgive you, then you can be saved. And if this is something that you want to learn more about, then please do get into contact with uh, the elders at Trinity Baptist Church or they can put you into contact with me. We'd love to talk to you more and explain more about the great things that Jesus has done for you. Coming back to our passage, for the Jewish people, this substitution theme is at the heart of the Passover celebration, and it was meant to prepare the nation of Israel for the suffering Messiah. Each year as the events were acted out, the children were to be taught about how a substitute turned God's wrath away. When the time came for Jesus to walk this earth, he links the Passover with his death. And he sets up this new memorial meal that is designed to keep us focused on the cross. Every time we look at the New Testament, we see um, this focus picking up on the themes from Passover. So, for example, from Matthew 26, verses 26 to 28, we read Jesus uh, saying, well, well, while they were eating, Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his, his disciples, saying, take and eat. This is my body. Then he took the cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink from it, all of you. This is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for the forgiveness of sins. So we see that there's that taking part, that eating of the bread in this case, which is just like eating the Passover lamb. And then there's that reference to the blood, which was uh, in the case of Passover painted on the doors so that the, uh, so that the uh, Lord would pass over. But here it's for the forgiveness of sins. We see it in other places as well. Um, John 6 verses 53 to 56, where Jesus talks about how people must eat his flesh and drink his blood in order to receive eternal life. And when looked at in isolation, they are strange words. But when understood in the context of the Passover lamb, which all of the people of God had to sit down together and consume as a memorial of God's great act of redemption, then it does make sense. Clearly, our Lord understood that the Passover lamb was a picture of what he would achieve on the cross. So when he set up the Lord's Supper or the communion, he was establishing a way of remembering what we could easily forget, the significance of his death. As Christians, when we are first saved, we are filled with amazement and wonder at what the Lord has done for us. We want to learn more about what Christ has done. And we are very keen to tell others. So when we start out in our Christian lives, it seems like we'll never forget. But as time goes on, we can become so familiar with the cross and Jesus's death that it starts to lose its impact. We can easily fall into the trap of just going through the motions, unthinkingly sharing communion, but never really engaging with its meaning. Or we may start to get so interested in other areas of Christian work or theology that the importance of the cross starts to drift from the center. Sharing communion together brings us back to the heart of our faith. Our Lord dying on the cross as our substitute in our place so that we can enjoy true eternal life, which is, according to John 17, knowing God the Father and God the Son. This true eternal life can only be experienced when our sins are cleared away, which is what Jesus does for us when he dies on the cross. We must carefully remember what can be easily forgotten. We are saved by the grace and mercy of God, which changes everything about us and brings an entirely new lifestyle. We see this in our lives as we become members of the body of Christ and realize that we are just passing through this life. For the Jews back in Egypt, the Passover was also a moment of great change. One theologian has said, before the Passover, Israel could not leave Egypt. After the Passover, they could not stay. The Feast of Unleavened Bread, which followed the Passover, was a week-long celebration of them leaving Egypt and entering the wilderness to journey to the Promised Land. If the lamb was the heart of the Passover, then the unleavened bread was at the heart of this feast. Unleavened bread is bread that is made quickly while on the move. Now, those of us who make bread, we know how important it is to let the dough sit for a while and then rise as the yeast does its work. But if you're in a hurry, then you just don't have time for this step. And what happens is you end up with a flatbread that does not taste all that good when compared to your usual loaf. For us today, when we read about yeast in the Bible, we automatically think about sin because the Apostle Paul uses sin as an illustration 
He uses this, sorry, as an illustration of the penetrating, destructive qualities of sin in 1 Corinthians 5, verse 6. And of course, it is a wonderful way of describing how one little sin makes everything rotten. Um, in the Old Testament, we see that there is um, um, real, I think so yeast is used in that way. We read about the sacrifices that were to be made in the tabernacle and temple. They mustn't have any leaven in them. And here in the Feast of Unleavened Bread, once again, there's no mention, they're saying that yeast is not allowed. There's no place for leaven whatsoever. Of course, when the Feast of Unleavened Bread was originally put into place, the emphasis was on haste, on the speed that they had to leave more than everything else. And eating this bread was an act of obedience, which took them back to and reminded them of how the Lord had led them out of the land of their captivity. For the Jews, the Feast of Unleavened Bread is marking the moment that they become a pilgrim people, journeying through the wilderness to the promised land. During that journey, unleavened bread would have often been eaten and they wouldn't have enjoyed the comfort of a settled existence which allowed them to make bread properly. As Christians, we too are also a pilgrim people who are journeying through life. And it's important that we never forget this and become too comfortable. While we may have been greatly blessed by the Lord, we know that one day all of us will reach journey's end and we will see our saviour face to face. Until that day, it is really important for us to keep on remembering everything that the Lord has done for us. Individually, we can spend some time thinking about how the Lord brought us to salvation, thinking through our testimony and reminding ourselves of how good God has been. As we look to the future, we can need to remind ourselves that we are just passing through this life and that one day we will have to leave everything behind and we will see Jesus. And this can be really reassuring for some of us who are struggling with great difficulty because we really sense that we are in the wilderness, especially now with COVID-19 going on. Thinking about seeing the Lord and reminding ourselves that we're just passing through gives us strength for each day. Others of us, we may be enjoying a period of peace and stability. And in that case, we need to remember that the world is not our home and one day we will leave it all behind. Then as a group of believers, it is important that we remember what Christ has done for us at the cross. As we prepare to share communion together, let us focus on hearts and our hearts and minds on him who was the true Passover lamb, who was our perfect substitute the one who gave his life so that we could be saved, so that we could all live. As we eat the bread and drink the wine, let us carefully remember so that we do not forget. Amen. Uh, let's um, pray together briefly then. Father God, we do just thank you that you are a redeeming God. We thank you that all those years ago, you were preparing your people for the Messiah by having that Passover lamb as a substitute at the heart of the most important meal of the year. And we do just praise you that when our Lord and Saviour came, he was faithful unto death. He went to that cross and there he hung and bled and died because of the things that we have done wrong. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that uh, you use your son as a substitute for us so that we could be forgiven so that we could be clothed in his righteousness and come into your presence as your forgiven children. We thank you, Father God, for the incredible grace and mercy that you have shown us. And we do just want to pray that you help us to always remember what you have done. Help us to not be forgetful, but be filled with grateful thanks as we remember your great love, mercy and grace. Amen. <laughs>